Hey there, Jason Schaffer here of M0A.com, and I want to introduce my very good friend and partner in aviation mastery, Gary Reeves. These seminars, by the way, are brought to you by our good friends from Avemco Insurance Company, and they make all of these FAA safety seminars really happen. Let's talk about our speaker, Gary Reeves. Gary is truly the expert in all things single pilot IFR, and really the entire avionics suite behind it. When we upgraded 2.3 Mike Zulu, Gary is the person we went to to help us with our entire new panel. Gary is an expert in Genesis Autopilots, Foreflight, Avidyne, Garmin, and so many other avionics suites as well. Gary has over 7,500 flight hours. He's an airline transport pilot, a master flight instructor, instrument instructor, and multi-engine instructor. So what does that mean to be a master flight instructor? Let me put it into perspective for you. There's 112,000 flight instructors in the United States, yet less than 800 master flight instructors. That puts Gary into a pretty special category there. Gary has provided his three-day mastering IFR programs to aircraft owners in over 30 states, including one of them, us here in Ocala, Florida, where we're located. Gary is also the national training provider for two huge names in aviation, those being Avidyne and Genesis Autopilots. He's their exclusive national training provider. So it's without further ado, I introduce to you the guy in the pink shirt, the 2019 National Flight Instructor of the Year, my good friend, Gary Reeves. You know, it just gets funnier every time I see it. Well, welcome you all to an online webinar. So much appreciate you being here. This particular series of webinars, of course, all of our webinars are sponsored by Avemco. This is also co-sponsored by Genesis, who uh, I have their autopilot in my airplane, and you know, my personal feelings is it's the best autopilot out there. But a lot of people don't know they don't just make autopilots. The Genesis S Tech family does make autopilots, and they also make a really cool bunch of stuff for helicopters and synthetic vision ephises and a bunch of stuff you may not even know about. So uh, wander over, over to genesis-aerosystems.com uh, or you can always reach out to me. One of the biggest things I always tell people in our public presentations is we would love for you to join the FA safety team. It's an all-volunteer team out there. You don't have to be an instructor. And this is directly off the fasafety.gov website. A FAST team member is anyone, even a student pilot, who just makes a conscious effort to promote aviation safety and become part of the shift in safety culture. So please become a member and volunteer over at fasafety.gov. We'll apologize. Uh, this particular video is recorded on April 9th, 2020. I will occasionally take a drink, clear my throat, maybe even cough. I do not have any diseases. I have allergies. Several years ago, I escaped Southern California and moved to Texas. I live on two and a half acres of land that is nothing but green pollinating stuff right now. And no amount of allergy medicine will ever help me. So I do apologize if I occasionally cough or clear my throat. And uh, just in this particular time of the national everything going on, I hope you all are safe. And thanks for being part of the PilotSafety.org family and continuing your education even online when you're not able to, sometimes in person. <clears throat> Before I start the conversation tonight and all the funny stories, I want to talk about primacy. So uh, primacy is a law that says this, and it, I'm applying it to aviation, but it applies to everything. Whatever you are told first whether it's right, wrong, changes, or was never right, will be in your heart the hardest thing to get over. People always believe what they were taught first is true. So if I'm going to teach you something tonight, and I'm hopefully going to teach you several things tonight, that will directly contradict what you were taught in your flight training, 
I need you all to try and have an open mind and remember that if I teach you something different than what you were taught first, it's not wrong. It's just a different way of looking things. So primacy says, is a different way than what you were taught first wrong? No, just different. But people sometimes have a very strong emotional reaction. Well, I was taught this. You're wrong. I'm right. Well, that's normal. That's just a normal human behavior to get an emotional upset when anybody contradicts what you quote, and it's hard to do air quotes on a, a video recording, but imagine Gary Guy, I actually am wearing a bright pink shirt. I'm not hard to find. If you've never met me, come see me at a public show. Come say hi. It's the greatest thing you can do for me is to come say hi. Um, and seriously, I'm not hard to find. I'm only in a pink shirt, but imagine me here in a pink shirt in my uh, recording studio in North Texas, air quote saying emotional response. That's normal in all humans. And an emotional response can be anger. It can be, I just reject whatever you want. But let's discuss some of the three most popular aviation myths today. One, red light is good for night vision. Y'all, that's total garbage. It's always been wrong. It's a myth from World War II. There are so many medical studies proving that red light and green light and blue light are all total garbage and they interfere and impair night vision. Now, being a good pilot, just like you, I have 500 red flashlights and I've thrown them all out. No, not true. I actually just give them to Goodwill or, you know, the local charity. But you should never use red light in aviation while you're flying. The only correct light is a white light that is dimmable and you can buy those flashlights off of Amazon. Uh, or some pilot supply shops. But red light is total garbage. It directly interferes with the cones and the rods, which are the center of your fovea and the back of your eye. And I'm not going to go into details, but trust me when I say this, red light is wrong. I also hear people say, well, if a circuit breaker pops in flight, you should wait 30 seconds and then reset it. No, that is one of the biggest causes of in-flight cabin fires. I was taught that too, and it's totally wrong. Circuit breakers pop because there's a problem in the wire. When you re-energize a dam damaged wire, you are going to cause fires. You're going to cause problems. Uh, one of the biggest accidents I talk about is a guy who on a pre-flight found a prop circuit, pop circuit breaker. He was using a written checklist, and I promise you, every checklist you have says on the pre-flight, you are supposed to check circuit breakers. It does not say reset popped ones. It just says check. If you find a circuit breaker popped on pre-flight, do not fly the plane without a mechanic looking at the system. And if anything pops in flight once, it's good, you're done, never reset it. And here's the other popular myth. And this, all of these are just total Gary opinions. I don't work for the FAA, I, I work for me. <clears throat> and this is one of the biggest things that bothers me is people keep telling me you should drop the gear to capture a glide slope. Well, here's the problem. I've actually got accident reports. I don't make stuff up. I, I do my studies. I've actually got a bunch of NTSB accident reports and ASRS reports that I can prove to you that dropping the gear at glide slope is a contributing factor in some gear up landings. Well, I said this at a national convention. I think you should drop the gear five minutes or five miles before you get to the initial approach fix. And everybody gets upset. And that's way too soon. I, it's a primacy reaction. I don't take it personally. But I said this at a pilot owners group. And the head of the safety committee, a very smart person who's also a DPE, jerks me outside at, uh, at breakfast the next day and goes, you can't tell people to drop their gear before the initial approach fix. If you drop the gear early in this kind of plane, you're going to cause a lot of people to stall spin. What? Like, this guy is so smart. I'm thinking maybe he understands aerodynamics that I don't get. Dropping your gear early will cause an increase in stall spins. What? No, of course not. Dropping your gear early makes the plane more stable, not, not less. But it violated everything he knew. 
and he actually corrected me at the convention, told people I was wrong. He didn't bother to listen to my arguments. So here's my arguments, and I'm going to let you all make your own decisions on this. When do most accidents happen? And I don't make this stuff up. This is straight from the FAA. When do you think most accidents happen? Final approach and landing. Let me ask you a question. When do you think workload is highest? When do you think you have to make the most decisions fastest in IFR or VFR, final approach and landing? When do you think people are the most fatigued and prone to miss stuff? Well, yeah. So when I tell people to drop their gear before the initial approach checks, look, I understand dropping the gear helps capture a glide path. That's great. It also is a contributing factor in some gear up landings, and I can prove it. So one of the biggest problems with pilots is something called decision fatigue. So I know this. If you drop your gear and approach flaps before you get to the initial approach fix, it slows everything down. You have more time to confirm that your gear is down visually and with green lights or whatever you got. And by slowing the whole approach down and spacing out your decisions, it makes it safer. And uh, I want to acknowledge a friend of mine, Peter King, who is the chief training safety guy for Epic Aircraft. And uh, he heard this and thought about it and goes, you know what, Gary, I'm going to start teaching it too. And I love the terminology he came up with this. He now teaches people to drop their gear and flaps earlier as a speed reduction device. So I need you all, <coughs> sorry, need you all to take an oath with me that you will try and control emotional reactions when I confront primacy tonight. And this is much funnier when I do it live, but would everyone at home please raise your right hand? At which point I joke, no, that's your left hand. Y'all just got to pretend to laugh with me. I want you to look at the screen and say this. I state your name. When Gary says something different than I have been taught before, won't throw anything at your own computer screen. Again, this is much funnier live. And my promise to you is this. I'm just going to be me. I'm not going to worry about passing check rides. I'm not going to worry about ACS standards. All I care about is to make you safer at the end of this recording than you were before. The goals of this recording, pretty simple. One, I hope you laugh. I think especially today, uh, in April of 2020, I think we all need to just laugh a little bit more. Try it. You'll feel better. And number two, I want you to look at emergencies in a different way. And three, my real goal is hopefully one day I might help save your life. So I don't know if you all know about uh, know this about me, but many, many years ago, I owned one of the biggest flight schools in Southern California. And I was hot summer day, and I had scheduled four lessons that day. And you shouldn't do this, but when you're young CFI, the money just kind of overpowers you sometimes. So I scheduled a fourth lesson with the understanding that the fourth lesson was with a 1,500-hour pilot, a guy named Rick. He's a very smart guy. I wasn't really going to have to teach him anything. I'm just checking him out in a 182RG so he can rent it and, uh, you know, do whatever he needs to do. So he already knows how to fly. So he does the pre-flight inspection Why? I, of course, sit in the air-conditioned office because, you know, I'm a flight instructor. And he comes back in 15 or 20 minutes later, which is a little short, but okay, whatever. And uh, a friend of mine who's a couple hundred hours says, well, can I go along in the back and watch? Yeah, sure, come on. So I told him, look, all we want to do today is I just want to do a couple short fields, a couple soft fields, get you used to landing the plane, get you used to the gear. He goes, okay. I says, oh, we taxi out and... Say, all right, give me a short field takeoff and a short field landing. And the short field takeoff was awful, and the first landing was even worse. I think the politically correct term is horrific. I, yeah, It was just bad. I said, all right, get off the runway, taxi back. Now, to the flight instructors out there, I am sharing my personal opinions with me, or uh, with, with you. I don't do touch and goes. I don't believe in touch and goes. I don't like touch and goes. I think it's rushed. I think if you're going to do a landing, you should exit the runway, run a after landing checklist, 
taxi back to full length. I don't do intersection takeoffs until somebody out there can send me mathematical proof or one thing that using less runway makes it safer. I am never going to intercept an intersection takeoff. I don't care if I have to hold 10 minutes. I want the full length of the runway. So we taxi back. We do an after landing checklist. We taxi back. We do a before takeoff checklist. <clears throat> I said, all right, let's try that again. And his takeoff was a little bit better, but the second landing was even worse. Like, not only short field, like we floated halfway down and still bounced. Get off the runway. He runs his after landing checklist. And I, at that point, I knew I should just probably call it a day. I said, but, you know, come on, taxi back, we'll do one more. I said, look, you got to use your checklist. And I'm going to run the checklist and I'm going to work the radios and you just fly the plane. So we do a short field takeoff and it's, a little bit better, I guess. And as we're upwind, I'm CBF Gump, scow flaps, boost pump, flaps, gas, under. And as I say the word under carriage, I don't even get the whole word out. Long Beach Tower says, continue upwind, I'll call your turn. Okay, and I acknowledge that. And then he says, okay, turn crosswind now. Okay, fine. So we turn crosswind, then we go downwind, and I start the written checklist again. Cow flaps, boost pump, flaps, gas, under. And as I swear, as I say the word under carriage, I don't even get to the C. I get under out. And Long Beach Shower says, continue downwind, I'll call your base. Fine, you'll, you'll call her base. Start the checklist again and don't even get to the word under. I just get und out. And Long Beach Shower says, turn base now, short approach, approve, clear to land, two five break. Full stop. And the guy just doesn't even start a good coordinated turn. And I looked at him and and I promise you, I said this word for word verbatim. I said, my controls, uh, darn it, which has been edited for video. I used a slightly stronger word. I'm going to show you how to do a good short field landing. And I got to tell you, it was the best short field landing I have ever done. I hit exactly the top of the numbers and brought that airplane to a complete stop in about 14 and a half feet. <laughs> Total true story. I used what uh, I now refer today as the Gary Advanced Propeller Braking System. You'll be surprised how fast an airplane will stop sliding on metal with the propeller digging holes in the runway. So I'm sitting there in the airplane and I say, all right, get out. I go, master switch off, fuel off, keys off and out, give me the keys, get out. And he looks at me and goes, should we put the gear handle down? And I go, no, I think they'll probably figure it out. So we get out and we're sitting there looking at all the red fluid leaking out of the prop and the nice new aerodynamic curly Q prop. And uh, the airplane's totaled and, you know, you know whatever, it's, that's what insurance is for. And I'm sitting there by the side of the runway and the airport manager drives up and he's like, Gary. And I'm like, hey, he goes, hey, did you see the accident? And I go, yeah, yeah, I did. He goes, oh, do you think the gear failed? And I go, oh, no, pretty sure the pilot just forgot to put it down. And he goes, well, why do you think that? And I go, because I was the pilot. And he goes, ooh, I'm like, yeah, thanks. And then uh, the fire department shows up, and they're like, Gary, and I'm like, hi. And they're like, oh, did you see the accident? Yeah, I don't think the pilot put the gear down. And they go, well, why? And I'm like, because I was the pilot. Okay. And the airport manager drives back up and hands me his cell phone. <clears throat> the FISDO would like to talk to you. Fine. So I take my cell phone, or take his cell phone. Hello, this is Gary. Reeves? Nate, how you doing, buddy? Oh, man, great to hear from you. How you doing? Did you see the accident? Yeah, I didn't put the gear down. I was a pilot. Ooh, well, we'll talk on Monday. And that just kind of went on. But here's what I need you all to take from this, is that all pilots make mistakes, and all good pilots make better mistakes. In fact, the more time and more hours and the better I seem to get, the bigger my mistakes seem to happen, especially when you're tired and distracted, which is why I want instrument rated pilots to put their gear down way before final. Pre-flights require a written checklist and the pilot did not use that. Uh, it is in the written checklist for the Cessna 182RG series that you check the gear warning horn. The gear warning horn was known to be broken. The owner of this airplane knew it was inoperative, which makes the plane illegal to fly. It's unairworthy and unsafe. 
And everyone goes, well, Gary, he admitted that the gear warning horn, you know, didn't work. So, you know, this is his fault. And I'm like, no. It was 100% my fault. I didn't supervise the pre-flight. I was tired. And I shouldn't have been flying when I was that distracted. So, yeah, the owner should have fixed the airplane. But it all comes down to me. And I will promise you this. The longer you fly, the more people will ask you, have you geared up an airplane yet? But, you know, I used an even better lesson from this. Let me ask you all a question. Have you ever thought about what you would do on an engine failure 100 feet above the runway and not enough time and distance to stop if you put it back down on the runway? Bring the gear up. Use the Gary Advanced Propeller braking system. What? That'll hurt the plane. Plane's destroyed anyway. If you have a low altitude engine failure, who cares about the plane? It belongs to the Avemco Insurance Company. They'll send you a check or whoever's insurance you're, you're using that day. I know this. The airplane doesn't belong to me the second anything goes wrong. It belongs to an insurance company. I'll take the check and go buy a new one. Or do something smart like buy an RV. I don't know. But have you ever thought about if you had an engine failure and the only open area to land is was maybe a small park, a football field, or a small city street? Leave the gear up, shut off the gas and the, the fuel and all that, and use the propeller braking system. I want you to stop now. I'm going to take five seconds, mute myself. I want everybody to stop and think of a scenario where you might want to either bring the gear up or leave the gear up in a retractable gear airplane in an emergency landing. Everybody stop and think just for five seconds. Picture something in your mind where that might be helpful. Everybody got one? Great. So I was one of the very few flight instructors when I was still teaching student pilots and private pilots and all that good stuff. Where's the very first lesson, like no kidding on a demo flight. I'd take people out over the Long Beach practice area, which was the harbor, and I'd hand them an iPad and I'd go, this is for flight and this is your little blue moving airplane. You see that little boat in front of you on the map? Yeah, now good. Look out front the look out the front window and find a boat. Oh, there it is. Yeah, that's a Queen Mary. Okay, now let's let's go this way. I want you to look over here. All right, do you see those other airplanes moving around you? Yeah, now go look outside the window and see if you can find any of them. There are so many flight instructors I've heard, and even today, April 9th, 2020 is when this recording's happened, and I hope everybody's well. I watched a flight instructor today teach me people on a flight lesson how to use a paper map and a plotter. Now, look, I'm all in favor of paper map and plotters. I have an E6B somewhere. It's probably a doorstop somewhere in my office. Uh, but I fly only using digital charts. I still take paper instrument approach plates every time I fly. I think it's a great idea. I think you need to know how to use paper. But here's the problem. Flight instructors, think about this. If you don't teach them from day one how to use the iPad correctly, and you say only paper until you get your certificate, the second they pass their check ride, they're going to throw away that paper map, pick up an iPad, and do it wrong. It's going to be a distraction, and it's going to be much, much more dangerous. Everything about an iPad is better than a paper map. It's better situational awareness. It's better traffic avoidance. It's better terrain awareness. It's more accurate flight planning. But all of that is only true if you teach them how to work it correctly. And most people that have been using programs like ForeFlight, which is what I use, for 10 years or more, don't know how to work 70% of it and have no idea how to use it quickly in an emergency because they've just kind of picked things up watching a few videos on their own. It's important as flight instructors that we teach them correctly from day one and the importance of still using paper backups. So I had a great private pilot student named John Moffat. Hey, John, if you're listening, I uh, hope you're well. And I don't know if y'all are flight instructors out there. If you've ever had a student that was way smarter than you, but John certainly was much smarter than me. Got into an aerodynamic argument about lift and had all these physics report. And I'm like, dude, the wing go up. That's all you need to know at this point. No, but this is why. And, okay. 
So he was really smart. He did homework. He studied. He flew off. And then he got his private pilot in like 41 or 42 hours. He's a great guy. And uh, he borrowed my, well, he didn't borrow. I rented it to him. A 1962-172 C model one night for a trip from Long Beach out to Palm Springs and back with his girlfriend. And he got back at 10 o'clock at night. And, of course, I was the owner of the flight school. I'm still there. All the employees are gone. But, you know, owners, were, we never leave. And he comes into my office, and he's flushed, and he's excited, and he's happy. He's like, Gary, it was so awesome. The electricity in your plane broke. Well, I don't think he and I have the same understanding of the word awesome, because it sounded expensive to me. But I said, okay, so? He goes, well, you always taught me that if the electrical system ever failed, that I could use four flight in an emergency in my iPad, in an emergency. And I go, yeah. So you, you use four flight, right? He goes, no, I just put it on a blank screen, turned up the brightness as much as I could do it, flipped it over, and my girlfriend held it like a flashlight so I could see the gauges. Uh, okay, then. And I'm looking at him like, you are the dumbest man on the planet. And then I'm like, you know, maybe he really is smarter than me. Do we really care how they use the tool to get down safely? Do we really care if people don't do it our way? No, I don't care how you did it. I think he did great. And you know what that shows? That being able to use a tool differently than what you learned by memorization, in other words, correlation always beats rote. And he really was smarter than with me. He used it however he needed to to get down. I'm very proud of that. Now, I know all of you have probably been in the run-up area with somebody blocking you. And I think one of the most common requests is we need two things in airplanes. We need a rear view mirror and we need a really loud horn. But I don't know if you know this. Some airplanes actually have a working fire truck siren sound. No, totally true. I was in uh, my office in Long Beach and I call him a kid, and he was not a kid. He was 19 or 20, but he comes in, and he was a kid to me. Comes in, and he goes, my daddy says he'll buy me a Saratoga, but I don't know if I like Saratogas yet. Will you take me up for a flight in a Saratoga to see if that's the plane I want my daddy to buy me? Well, first of all, is your daddy adopting? Because I could be a great second son. And he just looked at me with that, that look that, you know, my wife always says that people don't always think I'm quite as funny as I think I am, but yeah, it's okay. He just kind of gave me a blank look, and I said, okay, well, I don't have Saratoga at the flight school. Uh, there's a guy across the way with a Saratoga that he rents out. It's pretty beat up. It's not like a real very pretty airplane, but, you know, I, I know the guy, and he sure he would rent it to us if you want to take it up for an hour. And the guy goes, well, yeah, yeah, let's do that. So we do a lengthy pre-flight inspection, and we do a full-length takeoff of 258. And remember I said I don't do intersection takeoffs. Well, I don't do rolling takeoffs either. I always do full length takeoffs and I only do short field takeoffs. Why? Because it keeps my short field skills up. And there's nothing more useless on the planet than really nice pretty runway behind you when you have a problem. So full brakes, whatever flap setting was appropriate for that model Saratoga, I think it was 10. And uh, I'm walking him through it and I said, well, you're going to do the takeoff and I walk him through it. And we get rolling down the runway and we're accelerating pretty good. It's Long Beach was sea level and it wasn't a very hot day and there's two people in a Saratoga. It's turbocharged. And we're, you know, full manifold pressure and, and we lift off fairly quickly in about 50 feet. I can't see any more runway off the end of the nose. So I say, okay, gear up. And uh, he pulls the gear handle up and puts it up and starts smelling like burning rubber or plasticky or something. I don't know. And I look at him. I'm like, uh, did you tap the brakes before you brought the gear up? Now, I have no idea if this is true or not, but I was taught primacy, that you're supposed to tap your brakes in a retractable gear airplane to stop the tires from spinning when they hit the wheel wells. Y'all, I have no idea if that's true or not. It could be totally false, but I, I was taught it, so it must be true, right? And he goes, well, no, you didn't tell me to do that. And I'm like, oh, well, yeah, you're supposed to do that, right? And we are at about 150 feet of climbing. And all of a sudden, I hear this really loud fire truck. Ooh, ooh. And I'm like looking out the left side of the plane because we're over a large street to see if Long Beach Fire is going somewhere. And I think that's weird. I normally don't hear them this way. And it gets louder. Ooh, ooh. 
And I look over, and this guy's face is that exact expression, and he's howling. And all he can do is howl, eyes big as nothing, and point at my side of the windshield. So I, you know, 250, 300 feet now, look over, and there is a bunch of bright orange fire coming out of the right side of the engine, bouncing off my windshield. I have no idea why he was upset. All the fire was on my side. But I poke him in the chest. I go, let go of my controls, and went full power, overboosted the engine, dropped it immediately into a 65 or 70 degree bank at 400 AGL. Mayday, 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 Saratoga now landing, 12. We're on fire. Last transmission. And somebody said clear to land. I, I don't know who. How many of you have been taught that if the engine's on fire, you're supposed to pull the mixture? Well, that would have killed me for sure. It would have put me into a set of residential and businesses. I would have died for sure. How many of you have been taught to never overboost? Well, that would have killed me for sure. How many of you have been taught to never turn back at low altitude, especially in a steep bank? Well, if I hadn't done that, if I hadn't done all of those things, overboosted the engine, full prop power mixture, 70 degree bank into an 18 knot gusting crosswind. Why did I turn to the left? Because the fire was coming from the right and I wanted to turn in the wind for left. If I hadn't done all those things perfectly exactly then, I know I would have died. And as soon as I got back over the runway, mixture off, engine stopped. Well, engine didn't stop the windmill effects going, but the fire instantly goes out. We hit one, two. I stand on the right brake as hard as I can. Not quite ground loop, but pretty close. And a hard right turn on the one, six right come to a coasting stop right in front of the field fire department master switch off keys off and out i open the door i step out and he's all woo and i'm like yep come on and the fire truck opens the door and they walk out and i'm like hey and i'm like hey well here's the deal folks it was not an emergency to me an emergency is what kills people. A panic response that releases adrenaline is what kills people. So again, many, medic, many medical studies have proved that when your frontal cortex, the front part of your brain, is flooded with adrenaline, you make really bad decisions. You can't think straight when you're panicked. But it was not an emergency to me. You know why? Because I had already done this. So the best way I can do is give you an example. A billion and a half years ago, I was in the paramedic training program and I did all that and life was great. If y'all are walking through a grocery store tomorrow or Walmart, whatever y'all got, and you see a four-year-old little girl, cutest thing you've ever seen with pigtails, freckles, bandana, unicorns on the shirt, whatever makes her cute to you, and she is bright blue grabbing at her throat, swollen face, not breathing at all, mother in hysterics screaming, choking, choking, choking. If you saw that, is that an emergency? No. I went through, I was an EMT, a lifeguard, went through paramedic school. No. I'm going to put my phone in my pocket, walk, never run, because I might trip. I'm going to walk slowly over, pick up the kid, do the Heimlich, take the hot dog out, hand the hot dog and the kid back to mom and say, stop feeding this kid hot dogs, have a good day, and go back to checking emails and walk away and continue my shopping. There's nothing remotely an emergency about a child choking. Meaning this, I know it's an emergency to the kid. I'm sure it was an emergency to the mom, but I'm trained to do that. An emergency by definition is only an emergency if you're unprepared to handle it. So understanding the system is a lot more important than following a checklist. So how did I know to add more power and do steep bank low altitude turns in an engine fire because I'd done it before. One of my very first professional flying jobs besides CFI was I was uh, a captain or chief pilot or whatever they were calling me that day on a Cessna caravan. And if you've never flown a caravan, it's a giant 182 and it flies just like it. But it's really nice and fun to fly in a big PT-6 engine out front that never really catches fire, but you get a lot of false engine fire alerts because there's an engine detect system that's a little weird. But I went to caravan school at Flight Safety, and Flight Safety is an amazing group of people, and it's, I don't know, seven or eight or whatever many days I was there. I had never flown a turbine, but I was teaching part of the class uh, to the instructors because I knew how to work the G1000, and they knew how to fly a caravan. Between the two of us, we got it through. 
and I was there on my last day of flight training, and one of the very best flight instructors I've ever had, and I'm so sorry I don't remember her name, was a four-foot-nothing female instructor who was just amazing and brilliant and way smarter than I'll ever be. And uh, we did the, I passed my little check ride, and she goes, Gary, you know, I never do this, but I, I'm going to give you one more scenario, and if you pass it, I'm going to give you your pro card. And I'm like, okay, what's a pro card? And she's like, oh, well, pro card is never given to anybody on their first time through school. Nobody ever gets it their first time through. I'm like, okay, what's a pro card? Well, even, you know, people who've been here several times usually don't get pro cards. We only give pro cards to people who are the best of the best, and it's an honor thing, and you should be proud to even have the chance to get a pro card. I'm like, okay, I'm proud. Like, what is it? Well, it's a little laminated business card that says pro card. Uh, okay, cool. Now, the truth is, is I, I am proud of it now, and it's in a frame in my office wall. But I, like, whatever, lady. And I go, okay, what's the scenario? She goes, well, we're going to reset. We're going to put you at Aspen. And it's a 100-foot ceiling. Uh, you're going to take off with a little bit of a tailwind. There's forecast for wind shear. It's moderate snow. There's forecast for moderate mixed ice. You're at full gross weight with full passenger and cargo load. And I say, okay. And I hit the intercom button on the simulator, which does nothing. I say, attention all passengers, this is Super Captain Gary Reeves. Today's flight has been canceled for weather. I undo my seatbelt, turn around and say, okay, I'm done. Uh, where's my pro card? She goes, well, you didn't do the scenario. And I go, well, I did. I absolutely showed you that I am pro card worthy aeronautical decision making. Listen, y'all, I teach mountain flying. And the biggest lesson I teach people in mountain flying is you should never go IFR in the mountains in a single engine airplane. This is a horrible idea. And at max gross weight in Aspen, Aspen's the only airport in the U.S. that has its own FAR. Look, people die in Aspen. I was teaching a uh, guy who owned a Malibu. It's a very capable pressurized twin turbocharged plane. I taught him mountain flying, and I took him into Aspen on a nice clear blue sky VFR day. And after landing in Aspen, I go, and what have we learned about mountain flying? He goes, I would never do it without you, and I would never do it IFR. I'm like, well, then you have passed. And he probably deserves a pro card. And she goes, no, 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 you, you got to do the takeoff. And I'm like, no. She says, I'll give you a pro card. And I'm like, I, I'm cool. She goes, well, I'll give you a pro card and a cookie. Now you've got my attention. Well, what, what kind of cookie? Well, chocolate chip, I think. Oh, all right, let's do it. So I take off and she goes, updated weather. You now have a 15 knot quartering tailwind and uh, known wind shear. So I intercom, this can flight is can no, just do it. I'm like, okay, fine. I'm like, listen, I really don't think we should do this. And I, like, I turn around, like I undo my seatbelt and turn around, like, I go, I really don't think this is a good idea. She goes, it's just a simulator. And I go, yeah, but I would never do this. I would never teach anybody to do this. I don't even want to practice doing this. Because if for some reason I actually survive this, I might try it one day. She's like, it's just a scenario. And I'm like, fine. Cookie, right? And she's like, yeah, cookie. All right. So short field takeoff, 10 degrees or whatever flap setting I was using that day. Full power, hold the brakes roll and the thing is just not accelerating very well and I've got the TKS the anti-ice fluid running and we struggle off the runway and I'm 100 feet up but not really climbing very well and I hit 200 feet off the deck into rising terrain and I start going down and she's like wind shear and I'm like yeah I, I know and I am full power and VY and the stall warning horns gibbering and I've got it up to maybe a 25 or 50 foot climb and uh, all of a sudden, a bright red bar starts flashing on the G1000, and a horn goes off. Bing, 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 engine fire, engine fire. Bing, 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 engine fire. Caravan, whatever, ate my tango. Mayday, 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 returning to land Aspen. Last call. And I immediately break the safety wire on the auxiliary power. Now, the aux power switch on a caravan 
it's a lever that's not designed to be used. It's a direct, you just open the fuel and let it drain into the engine. There's no fine control like a throttle, and you're never supposed to use it when the throttle's working. So I break the safety wire on that simulator, and I shove that thing forward, and now I'm way over torque, I'm way over ITT, and I'm starting to climb a little bit better, and I'm turning back to downwind. Bing, 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 engine fire. She's like, Gary, you shouldn't use the auxiliary power. Uh, I go, uh-huh. She goes, Gary, you have an engine fire. I'm like, uh-huh. Downwind, I'm like, all right, everybody buckle up. This is going to be hard. And I kind of get up to about six or 700 feet, and I cut a short base to final, and whoop, wind shear, and I start dropping at 1,000 feet per minute. And I don't know if you've ever been in these simulators, but, man, it feels real. These things are several million dollars, and it feels real. And she starts giggling, and I went full flops, 60-degree bank to the runway. The full flops, you're not supposed to put full flops during a turn. You're never supposed to turn steep bank. You're never supposed to do any of this stuff, right? And I balloon up, hit the runway land, bring the flaps up, heavy braking, skid just a little bit off the side of one runway, turn off everything, turn around and go, cookie. And she's just looking at me. And I'm like, cookie. And she reaches in her backpack and pulls out her lunch and hands me a cookie. I'm like, thanks. Pro card. And she just looks at me and she's like, when you have an engine fire, you're supposed to follow the checklist and shut it down. What the heck were you doing? And I just calm as anything, look at her and go, well, I knew the thing was on fire, but I was hoping that might melt off some of the ice. <laughs> so, A, I got my pro card, and I'm very, very proud of it. But she saved my life that day by forcing me to practice what to most people would in an emergency. Several years later in Long Beach, when an engine fire was real, I didn't care about over torque. I didn't care about over temps. And I didn't jerk that mixture back just because a checklist said to, and it ended up saving my life. So it's the same lessons. Practicing emergencies before you need them is what will save your life. Go out with your flight instructors. Get up to a safe altitude. And slowly bring the throttle back to idle and do a 50 degree bank and see if you can make it back to the imaginary runway. Then do it again. Try a 55 degree bank. Now listen, I know it's safer going straight ahead if you have not practiced this. But some days, the impossible turn is not only possible, it is required, but only if you have practiced at first. And remember, understanding the system comes way before the checklist. The uh, real best flight instructor I, was, I ever had was a guy named Harry Leiter, and he was a banker that hated banking. And Became a flight instructor, and he liked to joke he had more times jumping out of a plane than flying when he was a skydiving mat. And we lost him, you know, many, many years ago to a, a heart attack while I was skydiving. But he was the guy who really made me a pro, because when he would teach me a new airplane or get me ready for a check ride or something, he would pull out Chapter 7, Systems and Description, and he'd pull out Chapter 9, the supplements of the POH. He said, go home and read these tonight and take notes. And the next day he would make me diagram fuel systems and he would make me explain how an air conditioning works and, and when can you use an autopilot and when can you not and when you all this good stuff. And the next night he would pull out chapter three which is emergencies and send me home with that. And the next day he would make me explain when the emergency checklist would kill me and what should I do instead. He'd make me come up with scenarios. So again, I want you guys to take 10 seconds this time and I want you to, I'm going to mute my mic. I want dead silence, at least on my end. And I want you to stop and take just a few seconds and write down three emergency checklists. It could be an engine fire on start. It could be an engine fire in flight. It could be uh, fuel exhaustion. It could be a blown tire in the road. I don't care. I want you to just take three emergency checklists that you have always treated as gospel. Review them in your owner's manual tomorrow or the next day. And look at the system description and come up with one scenario where you might want to do something different than the written checklist. So let's start 10 seconds. I want you to write down three emergency checklists that you want to create a reason not to follow the written checklist.
That was quick 10 seconds. Y'all got them written down great. You didn't know there was going to be homework today, huh? Oil, ice, and bears. Oh, my. So one of the reasons I teach uh, an intro to mountain flying course, and I still do, is because I lived in a mountain airport. I lived in a, you know, a 7,000-foot airport named Big Bear, and it was surrounded by 12,000-foot terrain, which is really a pressure altitude of 14,000, and let's not get into why people don't understand their operating manuals. But I flat out tell people, you do not fly IMC in the mountains, you don't fly at night in the mountains, you don't do any of this stuff. It's a day VFR type hobby, and you should never do it unless you've taken a formal mountain flying course. I got to tell you, a lot of the fatalities in Big Bear are uh, local flight instructors in the flatlands of Southern California doing mountain checkouts. There are flying clubs in Southern California that will not let you rent an airplane to Big Bear unless you go up with their flight instructor first. Well, their flight instructor has never had any more any mountain flying techniques or training, and they're more dangerous in the mountains than a person who's never been there because they're overconfident. There's a huge number of mountain fatalities that are instructors teaching who, who shouldn't be there. So again, take a formal mountain flying course. I have a very basic three-day intro, but there's some great ones out there. McCall and the Rocky Pilots Association and all that. But uh, of course, I violated my own rule. And I like to say that I'm the world's greatest flight instructor that you're listening to right this second, which may or may not be true if you're talking to yourself and your flight instructor. But I always like to joke that I'm the world's greatest flight instructor because I've made more mistakes than anybody and learned some great lessons. And I was scraping the snow and the ice off my nice 206, which has a brand new paint job and a bunch of new avionics now. I was scraping the snow and the ice and the frost off, and you got to have a clean airplane. You don't ever take off with any frost on an airplane. And it took me, you know, an hour or two hours to get it clear. It was blue sky when I started, and one of the things about mountain flying that people don't understand is how fast weather can change. And it was clear blue skies, and by the time I was done and my wife and dog had already started the drive down the hill, and I had to be at the flight school that afternoon for a lesson. Well, that right there is your first danger sign. Anytime you say you have to be somewhere, you know you shouldn't go. And I look out, and it's now overcast with light snow, but I can still see a pretty good blue sky window out the canyon pass. And, of course, I get my IFR clearance. I never take off VFR. I'm just not a VFR guy. Uh, I take off IFR with a telephone clearance, and it's called the Ocaso departure procedure, if you want to look it up. And it's eastbound, even though I live west. Uh, you got to go east to get through the canyon. I get through the canyon okay, and I'm just right in and out of the bases of the cloud and start to see some frost on my windshield and uh, I'm like well this isn't good and get out of the pass and I climb to a higher altitude and noticing that the frost is getting pretty thick and the ice is getting pretty thick on my windshield but I'm not sure it's ice I mean I'm just like it's a weird color like it's dark yellow brown like it's dirty or something I'm like well, maybe it's not ice maybe there's just a weird reflection or something and I'm like, well, okay, SoCal, you know, Cessna 49 or 41 Fox Drive. I'm going to need a uh, to descend. Uh, I'm picking up some ice. Well, we're unable right now. Uh, you know, you you got to stay at the MEA, and we've got some traffic. Uh, we can descend you in a few minutes. I'm like, well, no, I, I really kind of need to, to descend. I'm picking up ice. And they're like, well, are you declaring an emergency? And I'm like, no, and that was, again, my mistake. Like, I've declared a lot of emergencies. The only difference between those who live and die is how fast you declare an emergency. Because the faster you declare an emergency, the calmer things get. The only people who die in airplanes are the ones who panic and don't declare the emergency early enough. Carry opinion. So I'm like, well, no, but I really need to descend. And they're like, okay, well, you can descend 1,000 feet. And I get out of the clouds. And my windshield is completely blocked with this brown ice and it starts to melt just a little tiny bit and it starts to run and I'm like what the heck I can't see out my front window at all but I see stuff going down the side window I was in such a rush to get out of that stupid mountain airport that I forgot to tighten the oil dipstick after I changed it and oil was just pouring out the front cap. that really wasn't I mean it turned out I'd only lost about a quarter but it seemed like a huge flood to me and I can't see out my windshield at all. I'm flying blind into some of the busiest airspace in the planet. 
SoCal Approach controls 2 million airplanes a year, which is why I say only go IFR, because they're talking to 2 million people, and they're not, not even counting the people that are dodging everybody and not talking to anybody. So I uh, I say, I'm going to need an ILS 3.0, and, you know, I got a problem. I got oil on the windshield, and we need to make this a short landing. Now, I should have declared an emergency and landed at the first airport, but I mostly, like, I made lots of mistakes that day. And I'm getting set up for the ILS, and I'm like, man, I cannot see. Well, one of the recurring themes of my wife is my wife likes to say I am mostly controlled by the three hamsters that run my plane. And all three of my hamsters, well, there's one named Alvin, there's one named Simon, and there's one named Theodore. And I think Theodore's the smart guy, and Simon is the quiet guy, but I'm 99% Alvin. I'm just hyper, let's go do stuff. And I swear that Theodore came up in the back of my mind one day and said, Gary, you're a flight instructor. Move to the right side. Like I actually heard that in my brain. Well, that certainly helped. Who knew a flight instructor could fly a plane from the right? So you know what we learned that day? No kidding. Get their itis is a big problem. But more importantly, never, ever give up. I don't care if the wing's falling off. If you keep your hand on the flight controls and you keep calm, take some deep breaths, and you keep trying, you got a shot. And now here's your next homework assignment, if you all want to write this down. I would love everyone out there to hire a flight instructor. If you are not a flight instructor, hire a flight instructor and do five hours in your plane or the rental plane you use most often from the right hand side and practice takeoffs and landing and instrument procedures from the right. This is great for flight instructors. I think you should do this with all your students for at least two hours because flight instructors, you need to practice flying from the left because you don't do that often enough. All right, let's move on. We're almost done, folks. So I want to tell you about one of my great landings in paradise. So a long time ago, and 15 or 16 years ago, uh, it was New Year's Eve in Southern California. And I had a date with, I think, you know, the, the prettiest, smartest, nicest girl I'd ever met. And uh, I had no idea why she was interested in me because I was so far out of my class. I like to joke that I was shopping at Nordstrom's and she found me on the clearance rack. And I was had to go to Glendale, Arizona, which is near Phoenix, and I had to come back and I had a Piper O. And the weather was supposed to be pretty bad, but it just got worse. And this is, uh, sorry, I think it was coming from Deer Valley. And uh, this is what my flight plan looked like, and uh, that is not the actual Piper Arrow. But, you know, I'm just trying to get home, and man, the weather got bad. The winds were rough. I think my ground speed in that arrow was 60 or 65 knots. And it was a turbo arrow, and I just, I mean, people on the freeway were passing me. And I got my first experience of severe turbulence. Now, if you all don't know the definitions of turbulence, it works like this. Light turbulence is what most people report as moderate. It ain't. Just because the plane bumpy and you get a little scared, that's just light turbulence. Moderate turbulence requires physical displacement inside the cockpit. Hope I don't offend anybody, but if your butt comes off the seat, that's moderate turbulence. Severe turbulence, which I've been in twice and didn't enjoy either time, is momentary loss of aircraft control. And extreme turbulence is total loss of control. Your sock flipping in a hairdryer. Never been in that one. Don't want to try it. And the turbulence is getting worse and worse and worse as I get, you know, go westbound. And no kidding, all of a sudden, the left wing goes knife edge straight up blue sky. And nothing I do is bringing that wing back down. Not aileron, not rudder, not nothing. And I'm like, this ain't good. And then it slams down hard. The plane shakes and the right wing goes knife edge up. And nothing I do brings that down for a few seconds. I'm like, this ain't good. And as soon as I got those wings level, I immediately drop the gear and put flaps to 25 or whatever the mid portion is on that Piper Arrow. Because this is what I know. Turbulence is directly proportional to the speed at which you hit the bumps, and putting more things out makes you more stable. And sure enough, that ended the severe turbulence, but it was still moderate. But with my gear and flaps down, I'm now doing, 
you know, 50 knots at best over the ground. And man, I'm just, just flying along and I'm looking at, uh, or, you know, listening to weather reports and Southern California is now closed. Like the airliners are not getting in. And I'm like, well, you know, I got to do something because this girl's waiting on me. And by the time I finally make it to Blythe, I tell SoCal Approach, because I would never fly without, you know, flight following, at least flight following. I said, uh, you know, you want to change my flight plan? I'm, I'm going to, you know, stop at Palm Springs. And real nicely, he says, okay, we'll, we'll, we'll change that for you. And by the time I get to Blythe, a citation leaves SoCal to do an approach at Palm Springs and pops back up like two minutes later. So Cal approach, citation, whatever, we just did an emergency go around. We had a 20 knot loss of speed and severe turbulence on short final. Uh, and she's like, okay, uh, say intention. We're going back to Vegas. And she said, okay, well, you're, you know, cleared direct Daggett, cleared Vegas direct. And then she goes, uh, hey, uh, Piper Arrow Gary guy, did, did you hear that? citation report about Palm Springs? I go, yes, ma'am, I did. She also say intentions. I go, well, thought about it. And I go, you know what? I think I'm going to spend the night at Blythe. <laughs> and if you've never been to Blythe, California, that is an actual picture from the Blythe airport. So if you have been to Blythe, California, I need to ask you if you did it on purpose. I mean, there it, it there was nothing. There was one guy locking up the FBO, and I ran up to him as soon as I shut down the engine. I'm like, hey, man, I need a rental car. He goes, we don't have rental cars in Blythe. I go, okay, well, can you call me a cab? Because if I can get to Palm Springs, I can rent a car. Like, I got a date. He goes, we don't have cabs in Blythe. I'm like, well, can you take me to a hotel? I mean, do you even have hotels? Now he's offended. Of course we have hotels. I'm like, well, you don't have any flipping cars. And he goes, well, I'm not taking you anywhere. I'm going the other direction. And he goes, there's a payphone outside. So I go to the payphone and I got a bunch of change in my pocket. If you don't know it, folks, a payphone is actually a phone connected by a steel cable to a ground wire, a ground thing. And I got no cell phone reception, so I'm just stuck. So I'm calling motels and nobody can help me and I'm down to my last quarter or so and I finally get the super blithe roadway motor coach in which probably has half a star on Yelp and the guy is just super nice he goes well I'm a little busy but just wait outside the building I know where you are I'll come get you in the minivan as soon as I can I'm like okay fine two and a half hours later it is cold and dark and I am done and this minivan drags up, rattling and shaking. He goes, man, I'm so sorry we got busy. Uh, by the way, Happy New Year. And I'm like, yeah. And he goes, uh, listen, I, I've already got your room, and here's your key, and, you know, I'll check you in tomorrow. And he goes, uh, but, you know, the, we're, we don't have food or anything, but there's a sizzler across the street. Uh, do you want me to drop you at Sizzler so you can get some food? And I'm like, yes, yes, I do. Now, look, I like Sizzler. I had nothing against Sizzler, but... A sizzler in Blythe with a beer from a gas station mini mart in the Super Roach Motel 6 was not how my plans were supposed to go. But I was finally able to call this young lady and she goes, well, I'm just glad you're safe. And I'm like, wow, you mean the goal is not to get there at any cost. The goal is just to get there safe. How many pilots have you seen die because they had to get there? And by the way, uh, women or men listening, when you pick a partner off the clearance rack like this lady did, there are no warranties, there are no exchanges, no refunds, and we've been together 15 years. That's a true story, and that's my wife, Melanie. Next story is asking people for some help when you need to. And I found this off the internet. And I was out flying the caravan in Phoenix one day. And it was really not good weather. Phoenix never goes IFR or IMC. But when it does, it tries real hard. I mean, it was pretty ugly weather. 
and Sky Harbor had a closed runway, and it was just a nightmare, and we're all holding, and if you've never seen a stacked hold, you should Google stacked hold, and a stacked hold is where they put 10 planes over one VOR, and everybody just is a thousand feet higher than the guy below them, and then when the guy on the bottom goes into the runway, everybody drops a thousand or two thousand feet to the next layer, and it's exactly like an old style jukebox. Again, if you don't know what a payphone is, you don't understand that reference either, but it's uh, like an iPod, but it's black plastic and it spins. So I'm over Buckeye at 4,000 feet with an expected, you know, hold of 30 minutes. And this Bonanza wanders in from Southern California and says, you know, I'm going over to Gateway or Deer Valley or wherever. They say, okay, I want you to go hold that Buckeye at 5,000 feet. Expect further clearance in 20 to 30 minutes. And my little ears pick up because, ooh, look, new neighbor, and I'm a friendly guy, and maybe I can wave to him. And the Bonanza had the best radio response I'd ever heard. He goes, well, I'd rather not. <laughs> and Phoenix Tracon was just super cool. And they said, well, I'm sorry. Well, I'd, I'd rather not do the whole. I'd, I'd prefer just vectors to final, please. And the guy kind of laughed. He goes, well, we're pretty busy. You, you really need to hold. And the guy comes back and he goes, well, we don't really hold in Southern California. And now Phoenix Tracon is just 100% interested. And the guy goes, oh, really? Well, what do you do in Southern California? And the Bonanza goes, well, well, we just kind of do vectors to final. And the Phoenix Tracon, the Phoenix Approach guy was just so cool. He goes, no problem at all. Would you like to hold as assigned or would you like to be vectored back to California? And the guy goes, well, I guess I'll try the hold then. Now, for years, I've made fun of this guy. For years. I'm like, look, this is what happens when you don't practice. But you know what? He was much more of a professional pilot than I was. I was the amateur and he was the pro. You know why? Because a professional pilot will ask for help when they're not comfortable following an ATC instruction. A professional pilot, like the guy in that Bonanza that day, and not the amateur guy who thought he was good in the caravan, knew it was better to ask for help than to mess something up. Now, he got talked into it, but but really, he's a pro pilot. So, what lesson did we learn from that? Well, it wasn't the guy in the Bonanza's fault. They really don't do holds in Southern California. They really do vectors to final SoCal Tracon's a super Tracon. It's actually six approach guys jumped into one basement in Carlsbad. So it's six giant sectors shoved into one Tracon. It's called a super Tracon. They control well over two million airplanes a year. They don't have time for holds. They're vectoring you to finally get you off the screen. But you know what? His holding skills had really deteriorated because he didn't keep it in practice. Now here's my, I think one of my last stories. I don't know if y'all have ever been in a place where air traffic control talked faster than you could hear, but there's a true story where I was out at El Paso one day and wanted to go home to Southern California, Santa Ana, which is Orange County, John Wayne, and uh, Sierra November Alpha, if you want to look it up. And I said, uh, El Paso clearance, nine or six, nine or Romeo Echo, good morning, good afternoon. I'd like to pick up my IFR clearance to Santa Ana, Sierra November Alpha with ADAS Tango. Nine or six nine Romeo Echo, you clear to Santa Ana. And I don't know if he was trying to talk as fast as he could or if he'd had a sandwich in one side and was joking or what. But the man mumbled and he talked so fast I didn't catch anything except my tail number. And I looked at the guy teaching me in the airplane and uh my co pilot that day, uh, who was also happy to be giving me some duel in this airplane was named Gary and I'm like well you know if two Gary's are in a plane we must be pros it's a well-known fact that Gary's are the best pilots especially double Gary's make you double good and I looked at Gary and I said hey Gary and he goes what Gary and this is how that whole day had gone I said did you did you copy that clearance he goes not a word and I said okay I keyed the mic again I go uh El Paso clearance y'all gonna have to give me that clearance uh a little slower, please. <sighs> 96 Niner Romeo Echo. I said you were clear to Santa Ana Airport via the blah, 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 and sped up. It got worse. 
And I looked in, I'm like, Gary? And he's like, not a word, Gary. He goes, I got it. And I'm like, nope. I go, I will do it. Sat back. <laughs> Took a big giant drink of my sugar-free Red Bull. If you know me, that's my drink of choice. So yes, I am easy to spot at conventions. I'm carrying a light blue sugar-free Red Bull can. And again, only guy in pink. And I keyed the mic and I said, El Paso Clearance. Niner, six, Niner, Romeo Echo. Y'all going to have to give me that clearance just a whole lot slower. I'm a student pilot. Niner, six, Niner, Romeo Echo. You are IFR cleared to the Orange County John Wayne Airport. That is Kilo Sierra November Alpha. Via the El Paso 1 departure. That is Echo Lima Papa, the number one. Direct to, and 25 minutes later, I had my clearance. Like he spelled every VOR and every intersection and enunciated every single digit in the jet routes we were going to use. And I read it back and I said, thank you. And he goes, Niner, Six, Niner, Romeo, Echo, before you go to ground, do you have time for a question? I said, yes, sir, go ahead. He goes, Niner, Six, Niner, Romeo, Echo, can you confirm that you are the student pilot in the Premier Jet? I said, yes, sir, it's my first solo. Click and went right to ground. <laughs> Now, I got to tell you, I lived in California all my life, and I decided to move to Texas when I found out how friendly they were. I did. I escaped Southern California. I moved to Texas three years ago, and I've never been happier, except for my allergies and, the, you know, mowing the two and a half acres of land, which I don't do. I pay somebody to do that. Except for the mosquitoes and the allergies, I love this place. But, you know, that airport was so nice that they sent me a little thank you card for coming. And recommending that I might like Midland Airport just a little bit better next time I came to Texas. But you know what I took away from that? And I hope you all uh, enjoy that story just as much as, I'm, as I do. It was the same thing the guy in the Bonanza did. Man, a pro pilot, if you're not sure, you need to ask. So let's go back to that pro pilot in the Bonanza. The guy who wasn't good on holding because he'd never done it. I'd like you all to do a screenshot of this screen or take a picture with your iPhone or print it out if you can. And I would really love for you all to put this on your social media, tweet it, Instagram it, Facebook it, whatever else is out there, TikTok or something, I don't know. Share it with everybody you know. And this is uh, one of my favorite quotes. Uh, well, it's one of my favorite quotes, at least from me. And I came up with this with years, uh, a couple of years ago. And it's true now, just like it ever was. A really good pilot, through disuse and neglect, your brain will forget even the most well-practiced skills. Reviewing the basics or practicing just a little bit once a week can stop the erosion of those critical skills. And no, that's, that's me, the guy in pink. So this is what I know. People all over the world uh, pay me, I think it's real money, Pay me real money to come to them. And I'll come to you in Alaska. And I got back from Australia several months ago. I'll go anywhere in the world where a pilot owns a plane that wants to be great at single pilot IFR using their new Avidyne, Bendix, King, or Garmin, autopilot, iPad, whatever. But I really only work with the people that want to be great, just not okay. In other words, they want to be masters of single pilot IFR and technology, not just be the minimums. But it's so funny, my three-day program, it's 20 hours. I mean, it's a lot, and it's a lot of Gary in a confined space. And my jokes don't get any better, I don't think. But it is exhausting for them. And at the end of the first day, which is eight hours of just ground on the basics, they look at me and they go, yeah, you make this look so easy. Well, it is. I get paid to do it every day. The hardest thing for people who are instrument rated 
is you're never going to be as good as the day you took your check ride unless you get paid to do single pilot IFR every day and you do retraining every six months. In other words, that's like an airline pilot, right? So I know, especially uh, in today's times, and again, this webinar was recorded on April 9th, 2020, right in the middle of social distancing and lockdown that people don't get to fly enough. I would really encourage every instrument pilot out there to download x or Microsoft Flight Simulator. And even when all this nonsense is over and you can fly, but you don't get to fly every day, because I don't know, like you have a life, like a real job and a real family, that if you are instrument rated at least once a week, you go into your computer room and you do 90 minutes of instrument approaches on Microsoft Flight Sim. It has nothing to do with maintaining legal currency. It does not count. But if you flew IFR at least once a week, even on a home sim, you would keep your skills up. And this is why I want you to take this to heart. I really don't ever fly VFR. I've had 1,200 in a transponder once in the past eight years because I was sightseeing in Hawaii below radar coverage and that's all I could do. And I hated it. I mean, I loved Hawaii. I loved flying. But I hated not being IFR. It's not that I think VFR is dangerous. It certainly is more dangerous than IFR. It's not that I think VFR is awful. But this is what I know. If you took Spanish in high school and speak English for 20 years, your Spanish will not be very good. If you are instrument rated and you fly VFR, you are deliberately eroding and destroying your IFR skills. I take off on an IFR clearance. I shoot a full instrument approach every flight. Now I'll break off and join the VFR traffic pattern at Ontario Airport. And then I cancel once I'm safe on the ground by phone. It's only because I fly IFR every single time that I'm good at IFR. I'm certainly not smarter than anybody. But if you always flew IFR, and if you practiced on a home computer once a week, and you every single week did video training or review to book, you would be a master at flying and not somebody who just knows the minimums. Which brings me to this. I have a bunch of video training, including a brand new four flight and a brand new Avidine Bendix King series, and they are all on sale through at least the end of April 2020, and I'm planning on running it through May, but they're all $50 off because I want you to watch a DVD or use one of our online programs. I want you to pull out the FAR AIM. I want you to go to AOPA and do some of their free safety things. I want you to go to fasafety.gov and do one of their free online trainings. But people who want to be masters, not just the minimums, Always review the basics and keep getting better. So let me tell you about my Avidine Bendix King new program. We sold a three and a half hour video set for many, many years. And it's a great video set. And we have uh, stopped selling it as of today. It is now an online only program. It's going to eventually and probably pretty quickly be over eight hours. Not only do you get all the old content if you never had it, but I'm constantly going to add every single month a bunch of new quizzes, real in-flight videos, autopilot tips, display content, for flight tips, and a lot more. And you get a full year's access. And they're $50 off right now at avidinetraining.com. Now listen, if you bought my Avidine Training Program don't before, don't worry about it. Not only will you get all that old content remastered up on the online program, you'll get a $25 rebate even if you bought the program four years ago. And we also are rolling out a brand new four flight online mastery. Now the four flight online mastery is going to be over 14 hours of training. And you know, I, I run into people who go, well, I would never pay for training on four flight. I've had four flight for eight years. Yep. And you don't know how to use 80% of that program and you have no clue on how to use it really great in single pilot IFR to reduce workload, not just show a chart. And if you want to be minimums, that's totally cool. But watching a couple free YouTube videos, taking a free class here and there, and reading the first 20 pages of an owner's manual, man, that is not the way to learn. You cannot self-teach yourself new technology. Teaching or 
trying to learn something in a moving airplane by trial and error is just not the way to go. So my original video training program was over seven hours. The new one's going to be over 14 hours. And again, it's going to be constantly updated. And it's $179, just like all my new programs. But it's $50 off right now. And again, if you have ever bought a four flight training program for me, if you bought four flight seven at Oshkosh six years ago, you're going to get an additional $25 rebate. So I hope that works for y'all. Oh, thank you. Thank you so much. Okay, well, at least I think the applause helps. If you have any questions for me, if you want to do that three-day private training where I come to you and make you great at single pilot IFR, not just good, uh, totally happy to do it. Uh, all you got to do to get any information on anything, or even if you just want to send me a note, I encourage all of you to send me an email with, with the homework I gave you and send me suggestions on what you'd like to see in other uh, free webinars. All you have to do is go over to pilotsafety.org. You know you're in the right place if you see a whole bunch of pink and click on contact us. Y'all, I really enjoy these. These are hard on me to do the online because I, I enjoy seeing you all in person uh, so much more. But I hope it's been helpful. I hope you can look at emergencies in a slightly different way, and I hope one day it might even save your life. Uh, reach out and contact me anytime I can do you a favor. And the biggest, nicest thing you can do for me is please tell people on Facebook about us. But even better, if you see me in public, and I don't care if I'm in DFW, a museum, or out at a national convention, if you see a guy in a bright pink shirt drinking a Red Bull, that's me, come up and say hi. Come introduce me. Uh, come introduce yourself to me. The biggest kick I get, the biggest happiness I get is meeting other pilots. So I would love for you to come say hi to me, and I don't care where I am. I'm pretty easy to spot. Come say hi. I hope you all have had enjoyed this. I hope you all are staying safe, and I hope you all are well. Have a great night. This is Gary, the guy in the pink shirt reads from pilotsafety.org, and we'll see you all next time.